My name is Chris McGlinchey, and I've been working in the field of cultural heritage preservation science for about 40 years now. And the, my career began at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, where I worked as a scientist in the paintings conservation department. Um, after that, I moved over to the Museum of Modern Art to serve the broader needs of the entire collection. So not just paintings, but sculpture, works on paper, photograph, and so on and so forth. What I am doing here is trying to create a self-sustainable system within Beirut. Uh, the conservators here at Bema are doing wonderful work, um, but some of the um, treatments that they are involved with would greatly benefit from scientific support. Um, just on my own experience um, in both the Met and MoMA. And so if you have a staff of five conservators um, and 5% of the time, 5 or 20% of the time, um, they need technical support. Um, that's basically one scientist is needed for a group of conservators. Um, I don't necessarily want to be that scientist. What I what I am hoping to do is find scientists that are Beirut based that can help Bema here, and um, we've started um, by developing collaborations with um, AUB, and those are looking extremely fruitful, um, both from the teaching staff. The there are um, from the from the start, um, four very enthusiastic chemistry professors and one physics professor. Um, and so it's a super exciting and it's a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful experience for me to see young students get this energy. Um, and that's, that is just so rewarding. Um, and um, to allow them to speak their values is something that, like, I was so impressed, um, so impressed. I mean, these are very smart kids, and they have very, they are asserting very strong opinions about the field, which they are entitled to assert, because they are the next generation of conservators, curators, educators, and quite simply, museum visitors, and um, their opinions matter. So it's just an amazing opportunity for me to, to, to see educators facilitating these students and basically um, empowering them, so to speak, but also have these students um, apply their yearning and interest in science and apply it to something that they are really interested in. So it's, um, it is so rewarding for me. And this is precisely the reason why I stepped away from the Museum of Modern Art, even though I loved, loved, loved that job. I, I just knew that, um, Part of me in leaving that job was I created space for the younger generation. And also, I just feel that um, it's much better having a more flexible schedule. <laughs> so um, I've always enjoyed teaching. And one, one thing that's important to bear in mind, even though I've come from these wonderfully, richly endowed museums, um, I, I make the point that resources out there exist. You just have to know how to find them. Um, I think that the options here at Bema um, and in Beirut are limited. And um, I know that I'm essentially writing myself out of the, the picture, um, but I want to remain involved as essentially someone to encourage these relationships. And when, 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 when it's needed, um, help 
facilitate the conversation and share my experiences with um, simple things like um, how to how to um, you know safely take an invisible particle from a from a painted surface for analysis, but also share bigger picture things like the ethics of how far should a conservation treatment go and. Um, it was made very clear to me by the students, the vast majority of which um, were a little uncomfortable in erasing the changes that have occurred in some of these works, um, both naturally through natural aging, um, but also through damage. And I, I think they, they um, my impression is that they have an, a, a an, a, a minimalist approach towards the treatment and stabilization of art. Um, and I commend that. I commend that. They recognize that it's unrealistic to have um, um, something look good as new. It's a little bit out of touch. And it also indicates somebody is, a, is in denial that bad things have happened in the past. So um, it's just what I what I am looking forward to is the conversations about how to achieve the balance where the, the art still speaks for itself, but also shows some of those wounds. Um, in a, painters become painters because they're not necessarily wordsmiths. They're visual artists. They tell a story through, through painting. And um, preservation of that is very much like preserving the text of an important book. Um, so, I, so I do think that um, this recognition of preserving the aesthetic of a work is, is important, um, but not at the state of making it look brand new, as if it came off of the for example, oil paint um, not only takes a long time to dry um, after it's dry to the touch, um, it remains flexible um, for the first 50, 75, maybe even 100 years. And that's because components from the curing process are remaining, have remained embedded in the paint film. By 100 years, those components have evaporated away. And if they completely evaporate away, they're, they're not on the surface to be detected, but the paint is brittle. Sometimes they'll deposit on the surface. And they can create an effect that obscures the image. And the question becomes, is that what I am seeing deposit on the surface, or is it something else? Is it part of the artist's pigment? Is it part of their um, um, intentions to leave on the surface? So through scientific analysis, you can examine an extremely small amount of that, invisible to the naked eye, to confirm to you that it is one of these byproducts of the drying of oil paint. The question then becomes, is this something I want to remove? Is it disfiguring to the surface? Um, is, it, is, it, is it harm, would the artist consider it harmful to the aesthetic? And is it impeding the viewer's ability to get the message that the artist was, was trying to make. Um, you know, um, referring back to the observations some of the students were making about comfort with natural change, um, they, one may argue, do nothing. It's a natural process. But, and I respect that, but if it's something that the artist would want removed, 
or would feel that it's impeding your capacity to appreciate the message they're trying to convey to the public, would it be appropriate to remove a little bit so that you can reestablish what that goal is? And so that when you're at a distance, for instance, you're seeing what is important to the artist, but then as you get closer, you begin to see these products of degradation or products of aging that are um, you know, natural processes that were not originally there, um, but are, are, are nevertheless a component of the material and evidence of, of age. So, um, but, but, but having the scientific analysis to confirm what that material is, is, is essential to the decision-making process because you could stand in front of a painting for weeks and argue back and forth, but in 10 minutes, scientific analysis can provide for you an answer that says, it's this, now let's move on. Um, and I think that's very much one of my hopes for scientific support is um, to provide a measure of efficiency in the decisions that one discusses, as well as raise the questions of what is it we need to be discussing here. Perfect. So with paintings that are centuries old, it's easier to differentiate fakes and forgeries from things that are authentic um, using analytical methods because their science, one hopes, identifies materials that were not available to the artist. But one thing that's interesting about that is the main thing that scientific analysis can do is identify anachronistic materials, so materials that did not exist in the artist's time. Um, one thing you can't necessarily do, or do so easily, is you cannot assess quality by scientific analysis. So that's what becomes challenging on the, on the specific topic of fakes and forgeries. Um, scientifically, something may prove to be from that time, but it's, it's highly unlikely that scientific analysis alone is going to enable one to say, this is a Rembrandt, this is a Vermeer, this is a Goya. Um, so the, 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 the curatorial eye is, is something that is essential when it, when it comes to fakes and forgeries. With modern and contemporary, it's a little more complicated because it's easier for um, um, people to get access to um, artists' materials. Even you can go on eBay and find artist materials from 40 years ago and use those materials. If you're, if you're thorough, you can find everything you might need to, 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 to use. Um, so you have to have an integrated approach beyond just scientific um, methods, methods of analysis. Um, I can see BEMA taking a leadership role in its care for the Lebanese Ministry of Culture's collection of art. And um, not only just these incredibly skilled conservators that are here, um, but there's an issue that is on the mind of every museum on the planet of sustainability. And um, in my short time here, I've I've had an, an eye-opening experience and a broader perspective on the various roles in which sustainability comes into the policies of a museum's practices. Um, so for instance, um, while the art storage here um, was 
you know, less than ideal compared to um, traditional standards. Um, and when I visited, there was no electricity in the storage facility. We used our cell phones to light our way. Um, the fact of the matter is, there was enough electricity twice a day to run dehumidifiers. The building is well insulated. Uh, the humidity was between 48 and 50 percent our age. Um, I was impressed. I was impressed. And I don't think I've seen a storage facility um, that stable. And to do it without power, um, 70 percent of the time is pretty impressive. So um, I think that in providing some scientific support to begin to examine um, the condition of these works and um, you know, explore the issue of the impact of storage conditions on its collection and evaluate the, the art that has been um, you know, under Bema's care is, is, is something that is highly useful. And um, as I was talking earlier about this issue of how far does the conservation treatment go, showing a little existing or pre-existing damage or changes, um, to erase those changes requires work. And it's not just a person's work, it's a con conservation materials, it's time. And um, those are factors that cut into the sustainability. So it's, it's not just this um, single factor of um, you know, reducing one's carbon footprint by turning the lights off or allowing temperature and fluctuation to um, um, swing back and forth more dramatically than one would like. It's just about one's mentality towards the restoration. So um, I am just so impressed from the directors on down to the students that, that have this comfort with change. And um, I think that that's something that not many museums have grappled with yet. So, I think it's a very exciting time here, and I just can't wait to see what happens in the future. One of the things that I like did not even think about um, before coming here, it was um, one of the students asked this question about artificial intelligence, and does AI have a role in, in the work that we do? And, you know, we had this philosophical conversation about AI can be used for evil things and AI can be used for good things, but, you know, that doesn't mean we shouldn't explore AI because it can be used for harmful purposes. Um, having that idea about artificial intelligence used for, for a good cause in conjunction with students talking about their comfort with change and degradation I connected the two and thought, wouldn't it be great to have um, an artificially intelligent, informed model that can allow us to visualize how something might age in the future or how something might appear if it is damaged a certain way. And the value about that is it enables one to have the conversation before something happens. And it helps take the debate out of what should we do after something has happened. And if you, for instance, integrated artificial intelligence to an artist's interview and said, what do you think if your art changed this way? What do you think if your art was damaged that way? What would you like conservators to do? And um, we have to be respectful of the artist in the end. I mean, that's um, respect for the artist 
but also this recognition of, of, of change is, is critical. And I think when you get the balance right um, and you see what the artist wanted you to see and then later you discover, oh, it's got some damage, mentally how that registers in your mind is that this still has value. This is why it's in a museum. This is why it's on view to the public, because despite these damages, it's important to people. It's important to see. And that's what's amazing about this collection of art by Lebanese artists. I mean, I've worked at the Museum of Modern Art for 21 years. I think it's safe to say I've seen every painting in their collection. Beautiful, wonderful paintings. But I'm in the storage facilities with my cell phone light, looking around at things on racks, and there are beautiful things here. They really do need to be out and exhibited. So it's, it's just great to see some of these things. And I don't know much about the artists, but I look forward to learning more about these. And I think that's, you know, Bama's mission is to get these things out on view and to get them installed so that the public can see and, you know, feel, feel proud of, um, you know, their country.